Good afternoon. My name is Timothy Hampton. I'm happy to welcome you to the Berkeley Book Chat Series, sponsored by the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California at Berkeley. The Berkeley Book Chats feature UC Berkeley faculty discussing recent books that they have completed. Today we have a special event. Uh, we're welcoming Professor Ken Light of the D School of Journalism at Berkeley discussing the new book, Midnight La Frontera, which features photographs of US Border Patrol agents in their nighttime shifts on the Mexican border in the 1980s. We were very fortunate to have some of these images displayed in the Townsend Center last year in Stevens Hall before the pandemic shut down. So it's particularly exciting to welcome Ken to talk about them. And he'll be in dialogue with his co-author on the book, Jose Angel Navejas. Jose is the author of Illegal Reflections of an Undocumented Immigrant. He recently received his PhD in Hispanic Studies from the University of Illinois at Chicago, which may make him the first undocumented person, that is to say not DACA, um, undocumented person to receive a doctoral degree from an American public university. It's a great pleasure and honor to have both of these colleagues with us today. And without further ado, I'll turn the conversation over to Ken and Jose. Welcome. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you for the Townsend Center for sponsoring this event and also sponsoring this conversation that Jose and I will be having about um, the experience of me witnessing people coming through the border uh, as undocumented um, and Jose's personal experience of what it was like for himself and how is, it has affected his life and, and his family. Um, so we're gonna be looking at a lot of photographs and I am going to share the screen and pull these photographs up. So the conversation is centered around a book uh, that has just been published by TBW Books, which is based in Oakland, called uh, Midnight La Frontera. Um, and um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the book uh, the design of the book and the importance of the story. Um, one of the great things was discovering Jose's work. Um, and I did not know about Jose uh, before uh, um, literally being given his book. One, one night my wife came home um, and she had his book, Illegal, and um, she gave it to me. Um, and I started reading it and it was like, wow. Um, these are the most powerful and beautiful words from a first person experience of what it is like coming from Mexico into the United States. And I say that because there have been many, many books written about this experience, but so often it has been a white journalist traveling with undocumented people witnessing and writing about what they're observing. But it's so different, I think, hearing it first person from someone who has actually taken this journey. Um, and I was just um, smitten by um, Jose's just poetic writing um, and thought this, this would be a kind of fantastic marriage of text and photographs. The photographs now almost 40 years old are an attempt to lend visual humanity to an experience and a people that are kept marginalized, whose journeys and lives live entirely in the shadows. These are images we too rarely see, voices that are too infrequently heard, documents of a struggle for a better life confronted head on. They are striking, yes, extremely vulnerable and can help us understand the desperation and the risks that women, children, and men undertake to find a better life in the United States. They are a record of the inhumanity of government policy towards immigrants coming through our southern borders and fully deserving of seeing the light of day so that we might connect with the people in the images in solidarity, emphasize with their risk and harrowing trials and on a human level. Between 1983 and 1987, I took my Hasselblad camera with a flash and rode along with the US Border Patrol agents as they combed the line, capturing undocumented immigrants. Night after night, from 4 p.m. in the afternoon until 7 a.m. in the morning, I photographed the drama of the border as people desperately tried to cross into the United States. 
They were looking for a safe harbor where they could be treated with civility and create a new life in the land of the free. And this is a photograph of me one evening um, as a group of undocumented people have been rounded up by Border Patrol agents. It's really fascinating as an outsider, and I'm totally an outsider, um, to witness this moment of people's lives. Um, and the first time I actually went down to the border and began to photograph, I realized how important this story was, was uh, to be recorded. And it partly came from my own experience um, because generations ago, my family were immigrants from Eastern Europe. And there's very little um, or no documentation in my own family of what that experience was, was like. There's no, there's barely a recollection of the villages they came from. There are no photographs of my family on steerage uh, coming from Eastern Europe to Ellis Island. There are no photographs of them in Ellis Island. There's, there's it's just disappeared. The whole immigrant experience of my family disappeared. And so when I went down to the border, I realized this was an incredible opportunity for me to record this moment in American history. And Jose's words are so powerful. Jose? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and for, for inviting me to collaborate in this wonderful uh, project that you undertook, uh, Ken. And these are some of the words uh, that you'll find in illegal. The stretch between Tijuana and San Diego is long, very long, and it is as treacherous as it is beautiful. It is unlikely that anybody who has ever crossed it will easily forget it. Its desert-like landscape is bound to carve itself equally into body and soul. And this is part of the the introduction of a, of a book that I wrote based on this journey that uh, Ken is showing us right now and photographed on his wonderful book. Uh, and it's about the, the crossing of the border. Ken? Yeah, I mean, to, to witness this and literally in making these photographs, I am, I am standing next to the border patrol agents as they are apprehending people. And I think partly what made this so unusual was one, um, the access that I was given, which is impossible today. Um, the, the access now is completely controlled by uh, public information officers working for the immigration service and the border patrol. They don't want you to really see what's going on. And they finally have understood the power of making photographs. Um, but in the 80s, there was a kind of different attitude. Um, and I actually went out night after night with agents, not with public information officers, but with agents who were working uh, along the line, trying to apprehend people who were coming through. And so I actually was able to witness um, what was going on. Jose? My life in the shadows began some 20 years ago. It was a hot April night in Tijuana. That border siren that lures both migrant and tourist with promises of boundless prosperity and unchecked loss. That night, I joined a numerous army, an anonymous army. Under the infinite depth of night and guided by a sneaky coyote, we moved, slowly descending the slopes flattened nightly by the illicit weight of millions of other shadows who preceded us, denied a legitimate chance at the American dream, what better way to attain it than by penetrating America by night? And there is something about the darkness, um, and I'm sure Jose will talk about this, but along the border, it, it's dark. I mean, there are no at the time these pictures were made, and I believe at the time Jose came across, um, it, it, was, it was the desert and it's dark and you can barely see. Um, what I'm doing here is illuminating the moments 
with the use of the flash. Um, and the flash illuminates the scene, but it gives you a, it gives you a sense of the physical environment um, that that people are uh, are coming uh, coming against um, and try to make this this incredible journey. And it is a really incredible journey. Um, and there are there are forces um, on the U.S. side, of course, that are trying to stop people. Um, and and the thing that um, I found interesting um, was um, one, the kind of detachment that the Border Patrol agents had. Um, they kind of, in a way, turn off their, their own humanity. Um, and they don't necessarily see um, the individuals who are attempting to cross um, as, as people, as themselves. Um, in conversations that I had while I was riding along with them, there was extreme racism, which uh, was very, very difficult uh, for me to take. Um, I just kind of sat there sat silent, silently and let it roll over me. Um, but then to see just um, the, the, the sadness, the, the, the harshness um, of, of people during this time, particularly the children. Um, there were, in the 80s, there were a lot of children. Um, the way that the government at this point uh, dealt with people coming across was very different than they are dealing with it right now. Um, and so uh, what, what it was described as was uh, catch and release, uh, which is kind of a sad term. You think about fishing. I mean, it's a very inhuman way of describing uh, th these experiences, uh, but literally uh, people were apprehended, um, forms were filled out, people were asked to sign the form, which basically was voluntary deportation. Um, they would hold them briefly, and then they would literally take them uh, back to the border fence and have them walk through back, back into Mexico. Um, but, there was, but there was no sense of, uh, from the border patrol agents, no sense of what that experience for people was like, where they were coming from, why they were coming. Um, and in my conversations with agents, as I said, they just kind of turned off their own experience. Uh, this, this was a um, undocumented uh, man who had been beat up by bandits. And so during the eighties, and I think continuing to today, there are, there are bandits that operate along the border um, taking advantage of, of people, robbing them, uh, raping the women. Um, I mean, it is, it is a very perilous journey um, that, that's really hard for those of us who have been born in this country to really understand. I mean, this is this picture of people hiding in the trunk, for example. When I've shown friends this picture, they, their jaws drop and they say, wow, I don't know if I would come to America if I had to come in the trunk of a car. Um, and so I think this is part of the story, the part of the immigrant story that we don't, we don't see, we don't think about. Um, and of course, in, in recent years uh, under the Trump administration it has particularly become more hazardous and more dangerous and more fraught with inhumanity, um, even though in this period, it was, you know, pretty inhumane, uh, but I think it's been notched up a level. This this picture in particular, um, for me, was really a moment of um, great great sadness. Um, this is this is about one in the morning, um, and this is in San Isidro, um, and the agent has stopped this family. You can if you look. Carefully at the picture, you can see the railroad tracks. They're on uh, this train. There's a train that goes from Tijuana into San Isidro that periodically comes across these tracks. And they had been stopped. Um, and the sadness was, I mean, here is this family with two young children. Um, and the Border Patrol agent, um, in talking to the father, um, you know, is just untouched by the father pleading for him 
to let him go to Los Angeles because he needs to feed his family. And the conditions in this time in the 80s where the peso has basically crashed was, was so hard on people living in Mexico um, that um, it, just, it just made me so incredibly sad. Um, and it also, um, at this moment, made me realize that there was another part of the story, which was, you know, why are people coming? What is, what is life like in Mexico? Um, you know, and, and I did eventually, um, a year later, go into Mexico and photograph and spent time in Michoacan um, and in Oaxaca over two years, photographing the villages in which people were coming. But in particular, uh, when that book came out, which was um, in 1988, a book called To the Promised Land, um, a lot of the pictures that I had made at night were, were not published. Um, and when President Trump was running for office, um, his, his language was so crude and harsh and racist about the lives uh, of where uh, the lives of, of immigrants that I decided I should go back and look at the work that I had made back then. And I went back and I realized that there was a huge number of photographs that had never been seen, that had never been published. And I began this two year journey of editing and printing and organizing the photographs that I had made. Um, and pictures like this of the father holding his young daughter. Um, in a way, the, the power of the photograph um, is that this picture will remain uh, as part of history now. And that I'm hoping with this book and Jose's powerful essay and words that when people look back in 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years, what this experience was like. And we may be talking about, like myself, you know, the, the immigrant story of my family has been lost, which, which is sad because we're all immigrants in this country. Um, and I think the story of immigration and how people came to America searching for a better life is such an important story to pass from generation to generation. I was really hoping and hope that the photographs would be a lasting uh, document. And so when a grandfather talks to their grandchildren and the grandchildren ask, what was it like, Poppy? How did, what was your experience like? That somehow these pictures will visually explain what in particular this journey was about. The indignity of the journey, the harshness of the journey, the, the terror of the journey. Um, and you wonder, you know, for example, this young boy, um, I do, where is he now? What has happened to him? Um, is, he, is, he an Amer is he an American citizen? Has he gone back to Mexico and that's where he lives now. Um, these stories are so, so important to understand uh, because immigrants have built America and they continue to build America. And again, the, the children, um, the, the seeing the children and photographing them, um, and, and wondering, you know, what is, what is the effect of uh, this experience on children? Being apprehended with their parents, thrown in the back of a Border Patrol Ram Charger, often with many people. Um, what, is, what is this experience for them? How does it change their life? What is that story about?
And it's also interesting to um, really be observant um, in looking at photographs. Um, what are people wearing? What are they bringing? Um, often with just little bags, plastic bags, um, sometimes just with snacks or a gallon jug of water so they don't die of thirst. And the idea of a little boy, and if you look really carefully at this little boy, you can see the burrs in his shirt from when he was hiding in the bushes to avoid the flashlight of the border patrol agent. And the idea of him holding his hand, hands over his head and surrender. Um, and there's his father behind him. And then behind them is a woman holding a young child. At times while photographing this, um, as I said earlier, it just, it just made me really sad. Um, and it continues, I think, to make me sad in the sense that we have not really figured out what our immigration policy should be. And remember, these, these pictures are taken in the 80s. So from 1983 to 1987. And decades and decades have passed, and we still haven't figured out how to deal with this issue. From administration to administration, it seems like it's just passed along. I also in the 80s saw many changes um, in terms of how people were coming across and how they reacted. When I first started photographing in 1983, there were very large groups coming across. And uh, you saw some photographs, it looked like there were maybe uh, 20 or 30 people. And that's what I found in the, in the early 80s, large groups were coming. Um, and it really amazed me that a border patrol agent could in Spanish tell the group, you're under arrest, sit down, and all 20 or 30 people would sit down, very compliant. Um, and as I kept photographing, I found three years later, when the border patrol agent said, sit down, people ran in 30 different directions. And there had been a whole change, and I think a whole sense of being more desperate, um, that, that people really deeply felt they needed to find a better life for themselves in the United States. And this was another photograph of a grandfather. Again, um, you know, what indignity for, I mean, it's an indignity for young or old, but in particular, I felt this grandfather put in this position of becoming literally an enemy of the state really saddened me. And there was something also very interesting that I observed and, and maybe Jose will talk about this as we get into our conversation, how, pe how people felt invisible um, and how often you would find people laying in the grass, fully being observed, but they would often act as if they weren't there. Somehow their body and their mind being separated during these moments.
This is another photograph that I found really interesting, um, particularly how the woman is dressed with the, with the skirt and the shoes and the beautiful blouse that she's wearing. And a father and son apprehended. And many times there were um, situations where people were, many, many people were in cars. This was a group of five people packed in the back seat of the car. The back seat was taken out of the car and they were laying flat, hiding from the agent. And people who were stopped, just driving through town, questioned. And again, I mean, the children, the children really, for me, just tugged at my heart. I mean, you can look at this photograph and you can see four children the three children in the front and the very back by the woman border patrol agent, you can see a father holding a young child and just how there were often groups of people. So this gives you some sense of some of the photographs in the book. Um, and I urge you um, to think about getting a copy of the book. You can just literally um, Google Ken Light TBW books um, and you'll, you'll find the publisher uh, and, and the book um, and have the opportunity to look deeper at the photographs. It's, it's physically just um, a beautiful, powerful book very thought out. And again, with Jose's wonderful uh, essay. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jose. It's so nice having you. Um, so I'd love for you to talk about your own experience and um, both coming across, but your experience in America, which I know you're continuing to experience, it's not over for you. But maybe we start at the border. And also, what is it like viewing the pictures? Right. So I thank you for, you know, undertaking this, this project and uh, for paying attention to that very specific moment in the immigrant uh, experience. I think it is extremely important for several reasons. One of them being that, you know, what uh, the moment that you are witnessing at uh, that specific, uh, I mean, that specific moment is, you know, what, what's happening is you're witnessing the trauma of an entire people, you know, being cut, their 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 hopes and aspirations being aspirations being dashed, right? Because they're they're being Caught by the border patrol and uh, all the the illusions that they had about coming to the U.S. in search of a better life, they're completely destroyed at that very moment. So it's a very traumatic experience, especially having to cross that border, which is, uh, I mean, you know, as I describe in my in my book, is is, is, is uh, I mean, it's, it's long, it's very long, it's a desert. I mean, you're. Uh, you go out for hours and hours, you know, just walking or running or whatever in order for you to make a trust. So uh, I think it is important that uh, that this book is out and that it shows the uh, faces of people at that specific moment. Uh, as far as my own experience is concerned, you know, that happened almost 30 years ago when I first came across the border and it was 
under very similar circumstances as the, the people that uh, we are seeing in your in your book. Uh, obviously, things have changed dramatically for me. You know, now you know I, I would have never in a million years I would have never thought that I will be sitting here speaking to an audience of uh, one of the best universities in the world because that would have been something unheard of. Many of the people that you have seen in you know those pictures, I think, are very similar to me. You know, probably people who just finished uh, grammar school. In my case, I went on to ninth grade, and uh, that's where I came with. I came with a uh, ninth grade education, and that's it. You know, I left school when I was 12 years old. Didn't go back until I was almost 28 here in the States. And that is one of the reasons why people leave their, their home country, because the uh, uh, living conditions in their, in their native uh, countries are so dismal that uh, they're desperate to leave. So some of the people who comment that, you know, they won't, they will never go to a different country if they, if they had to do it in, a, in the trunk of a car. I think if they were on, you know, in a similar in similar conditions, they will think otherwise. But uh, I mean, that that's one of the big appeals. You know, there's this idea of of America as a way where you can make it, where you can reinvent yourself, and that's certainly my case. You know, uh, I was able to reinvent myself. Uh, you know, to learn a different language, to become an author, to become highly educated. At the same time, you know, I'm still in this same, the same situation, still as an undocumented man, because of the, uh, because of policies implemented by one administration after another, and he gets, he keeps getting progressively worse. One of the questions that you you had earlier was that how is it possible that 40 years have gone by and we're still in the same conditions? I mean, I think we, it's getting even worse nowadays, right? Yes. And, uh, and, you know, and it's not only because of the present administration, which, you know, has taken things to a different level, but on previous administrations as well, with, uh, with Obama and Bill Clinton, beginning with Bill Clinton, when he started building the wall along, along the, the, uh, the border, right? So uh, I, I think we gotta be able to, to see that, you know, it, it's been uh, a joint effort by both parties, you know, Republicans and Democrats who have been uh, pushing back against uh, immigrants. So, uh, that my, my experience is that, you know, this is a wonderful country where you can reinvent yourself, you know, but if you don't have, you know, the proper documentation, you can only go so far, you know, you, I mean, you become, you know, hyper vigilant, like the people that you've seen there, this is the way life is, it, it's like life, it's like living under COVID. I mean, those are the conditions that the undocumented population in the U.S. has been made to live for as long as they've been here. I know that that's my case. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, that the fear of going out, you know, you might be living your life and you go out and all of a sudden you're grabbed or can be grabbed and just always looking around and always being conscious of that, which is something with COVID that we, you know, not that we're grabbed, I guess we're grabbed by the, by the disease, the virus, but you're staying home and being careful and you go out to the supermarket and you're very conscious, get in and get out, which is probably, as you're describing, what immigrants who are here on, who are undocumented are, are experiencing. Right, right, right. And I think, you know, there is no, as I said, there is no political will. And I, I mean, we hear now, you know, Joe Biden is coming out saying that, you know, within the first 100 days, he's going to send this proposal to, to Congress so there can be uh, an overall whole of the immigration um, system. Well, hopefully, hopefully, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, I mean, after carefully, watching the, 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 the uh, election process in the US for many, many years, you know, with the election cycles every two years, I know that, that, that those are always promises that are never kept. 
And I think one of the reasons that they are not kept is because it is in the interest of the United States to keep a population that can be used for, you know, uh, for cheap labor, for cheap labor. So to, to us, undocumented immigrants, this is not a democracy. I mean, you know, it might be a democracy for you, but for me, it's not. I mean, to me, this is a caste system. That's what it represents to me, you know, because of the conditions that we've been made to, to, to live under and, uh, you know, and to see how we are used as political uh, bonds, you know, when elections come, come about. So, uh, I mean, I think it's in, in the interest of the, of the US to keep, uh, uh, you know, millions and millions of people in, um, in a condition like, like this, because, you know, I, who else is gonna go on the fields and pick your fruits and right. vegetables? Make right? your beds, mow your lawns. That's right. Yeah. Let me step back for a moment, because I've always been curious. Uh, I remember from your book, I, I believe it was your uncle, was it your uncle who had come across and who you heard stories about his journey before you, you went on your journey when you were in Guadalajara? Mm -hmm. What, how did, how did you prepare to come across? I mean, what was that moment you decided, I'm going to go to America? And did you prepare? And can you, can you talk more about, I know it's in your book, and I urge people to read your book. And a lot of it is in, in Midnight La Frontera. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience and what you were thinking? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So to begin with, I'm going to show my book so they know which yeah, one, you, what you're referring to. So this is it. Yeah. This is the book, Illegal Reflections of an Undocumented Immigrant. Sorry for the uh, self-promotion, but so oh, oh, no. University of Chicago. watching know what we're talking about. <laughs> yes. So uh, that is a really important question, I think. I come from a neighborhood in Guadalajara, which is the second biggest city in Mexico. Uh, that uh, where that's not even a question. So yeah, yeah, just so you guys can more or less understand where I'm coming from. That's not even a question. I mean, that that's part of our collective imaginary. This is something that you're gonna do eventually. Growing up, you know that this is the only way out because I grew up in a house with five uncles who all came to the US and they will come and go back to Mexico. So there was this circle of mi migration that's now, that now is, you know, part of our history books. It's, it's impossible to do that anymore uh, because of the, of the problem at the, at the border. But uh, to me, it was never, I mean, it was never uh, a question. It was a matter of time. When will it happen? You know, it, and it becomes, at least in my case, I mean, the case of many of the people who grew up, I grew up with, uh, it was a rite of passage, you know, coming to the to the U.S., crossing the border. We never thought of uh, of being able to obtain a visa because those kinds of things are not for poor people. Poor people cannot go and stand in line in the U.S. embassy or the consulate because they're going to be rejected and they know it. You know, you're going to be made to pay two, three hundred dollars on, on an application that's going to be rejected. So people know this. People know these things. We have always known. Uh, so it is a, uh, it's something that you, you grow up with. It's not a decision that you make suddenly. It's just the, the living conditions that you, that you are, that you grow up with in, uh, are so that, you know, this is part of, uh, part and parcel of, uh, of life. I think you mentioned that, uh, when you took those photographs, it was during the eighties, you know, during the, the, the financial crisis in Mexico. But I think too, that many of the people who came across, they had the same history as me for generations and generations. It was not that they were being affected by the financial crisis in Mexico, which affected many of the people in the middle class. The, the middle class who was very, you know, a very small middle class in Mexico it was never, it has never been, you know, Mexico has never been known for having a strong middle class as in the US. Uh, so I, I think, the people that we're seeing in those pictures are people from you know the margins of society in big cities or in small towns in different places, right? So to me, 
it was not a decision that I made in one moment. It was something that I always knew I had to do if I wanted to 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 uh, to get ahead in life. And uh, you know, and going back to your book, I mean that that, that traumatic moment. It, I I kind of like sometimes think of it as uh, the the moment of birth because you know yeah. you said it's very it, it it's very dark, right? Yes. And it was the first time, it was the very first time that I was able to, to witness the sky in its own, you know, magnitude and immensity and beauty. It, it was like seeing, you know, the, the, the miracle of creation. So that, that was like, you know, uh, uh, coming to life, you know, a second time, you know, uh, being born a second time. And, you know, the, the same thing, it happened to me eventually when when I discovered that there were such things as public libraries where one, one could go into and learn, but that was only possible many many years after you know being in the U.S. I, I was in the U.S. and you know you all can read my book and this is part of my my story and my journey in the U.S. and this is why the U.S. remains a magical place for many people, the the place that uh, that, that promises to you know to 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 give you a second chance. Now. The narrative that uh, that's all about, you know, about us needs to be reframed. I think uh, because, you know, and I think this is why your your book in particular is important because it, it, you're showing the faces. You know, you're showing the faces. We're no longer just this uh, abstract construction. You know, faceless crowd. No, I mean these are people who are courageous, who are uh, uh, living friends and family behind, trying to make a better life if they're only given a chance to do so. Yeah, no, I think, I think realizing these are real people with real stories and dreams is so important for us to think about. And, and as you said, I think Americans uh, often don't think about that. I know in my own town where I live, I remember there was a conversation in the community about um, trying to be a sanctuary city. And there were a number of people who said, oh, no, you know, there aren't, there aren't people who, who are undocumented who are here. And then um, my wife asked a friend about her housekeeper and her, and, and her friend just looked at her, you know, her eyes got very big. And for the first time, she actually even thought that her housekeeper might be undocumented. And in fact, she was undocumented. But you know, to her, she was just a housekeeper who came. There was no, there was no human connection that was there. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of one of the things I do hope is that by seeing people in this vulnerable position, we realize there these are real people with real lives and real stories and families and dreams, as as you're as you're describing. Right, right, right. And, and I think us who are in a position to change uh, the conversation and the narrative around this subject, around this uh, social reality, we, we, we should, you know, and, and it starts like this, having conversations around uh, people that we know, people who are unaware of this problem, and uh, to make them see, to make them see first that we are not we don't live in the shadows. I mean, this is what was really fascinating about the uh, 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 this whole narrative about you know undocumented people in the in the U.S. that we have become part of the mythology of the U.S. You know, like the cowboys and whatnot. You know, people going west, and uh, we're going north. But we are this uh, this army of shadows, right? We are we've been made to to uh, you've been made to believe that we live in the shadows we know that we don't you know right. we go out pushing uh, enormous uh, mo uh lawnmowers right right in the in the sunlight i mean we're not invisible people don't want to see this that, that's different that uh, is two very different things so uh i think it is our responsibility to change that uh conversation and to 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 you know to make people aware of the contributions and the, the very existence of people, you know, because from any, from any perspective that you look at this problem, you know, if you are talking about taxes, about work, from anywhere that you look at it, you know, I mean, the, the, the only, the only 
problem is that we don't have documents. Other than that, we're no different from any of you. That's right. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah, I know. And that whole term that the government uses illegal, you know, and how can someone be illegal when they're a human? I mean, it's it's completely ridiculous. So the first time you came through, you what you apprehended and sent back. That must have right, been right. That must have been a, a you know a, dev a devastating experience having come through and then having been caught and sent back. But you came through a second time. And yeah. You, so I think my my experience is very similar to what you're witnessing in, in you know the, the the stories that you were witness to in your in your book. And I won't be surprised that people came back after a second, uh, you know, after being apprehended and you know, for a second or a third time until they yeah. they get through because that's that's just the, the, the way it is, you know. I mean you're you're trying to find food in in um in a place that will be safe for, for you and your children. So you do what you what you have. Yeah one of the one of the stories that one of the Border Patrol agents told me was that um that I had photographed um a number of years later when we were talking, he said um, he apprehended a, a large group of people and uh, he sent them back. And then the next night he apprehended the same group of people a second time. And the next night, the third, you know, the third night, the same group of people he apprehended. And on the fourth night that he caught him again, they said to him, don't you have a day off? And <laughs> He did the next night, he had a day off and that was the last time he ever saw them. So, um, you know, just the, just the, um, the energy uh, of people just not giving up. I mean, it's, it's if, if you're here, if you've been born here, um, you just have no sense at all of, of the courage um, of the undertaking. I mean, it's a it's a massive undertaking. It's not it's not like getting on an airplane, going to an airport and getting on an airplane. I mean, it's a massive undertaking, really, of the human spirit. Um, and as you said, um, you know, you really hadn't been out of Guadalajara, and then all of a sudden you're in the desert and you look up and there's the heavens, you know, and the and the sky, and it's just this profound experience um, that I imagine just changes who you are. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, it opens wound. It, it opens a wound that never closes completely. It never does, like yeah. because you know you, you go into a different society where a different language is spoken, where the social codes are different. Uh, where you you may never be able to see your family again. I mean, all of that you know takes a toll on you eventually. It does you know beginning with that specific moment. So, I mean, there, there's a, an entire saga, an entire saga beginning at that moment that you, that you photograph so, uh, so beautifully. And then, and then when you, you finally arrived, what did you do? Did you have, did you so, have, did you have connections? I mean, you're here, what, you ended up in, in Chicago. Right, right. So I, I ended up in Chicago because uh, this is something people usually don't talk about, but uh, the Mexican community has been in Chicago in the Midwest for over a hundred years, uh, in the Southwest forever, <laughs> you know, before Anglo-Americans started sneaking illegally into the Southwest and taking over. Uh, but uh, so I had family who had settled in the Chicago region. Right. And they they lived there, so that it was very easy for me to to come to Chicago and you know uh, and start afresh there. So, but the first thing I did was I realized, even though I didn't immediately start learning, I realized that the first thing I needed to do was to learn how to communicate, how to speak, you know, how to learn a second language. Even though I mean, because what I wanted to do was to be able to just speak. To, to, to be able to, you know, uh, do basic transactions, going to the store, buying a soda, whatnot. I, I never imagined, never, as, again, in a million years, I would have never imagined being, you know, being part of a conversation like this. 
Uh, now getting, I know better. Getting your PhD. I would have never imagined. I mean, in my family, no, no one's ever gone to high school before me because, you know, in Mexico, unfortunately, it's still a, a problem. People don't go to high school because yeah. it's not a requirement. So uh, getting a PhD to me, I didn't even know what a PhD was, right? Until, you know, many years later when I started college. So, I mean, but, but that only speaks about the, the, the promise that uh, America still holds for many people, myself included, right? Even in, in, in times like this, you know, in such a, in a moment of uh, political division, like the, the one that we're, that we're living in right now, uh, you know, there's still promise and hope. And there's a whole lot of people who don't like us, uh, you know, they, they have their own reasons, but there's a whole lot of people who have made dreams possible for people who are, you know, who, who are looking for a second chance for all the losers in the world who are looking to reinvent themselves. So if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah, well, your story is, is a remarkable story. And as, as I said, when we started out, when I, my wife gave me your book and I read your book, I uh, was just so, um, uh, it was so powerful, uh, your, your uh, handling of the language and your way you described your journey. And, and um, it, it, it was just, um, I mean, it's, it's the reason that after I read it, I said, oh, I have to, I have to meet Jose and I have to somehow get his, use part of his text in my book because it just really, um, describes the experience, which the photographs do, but there's a whole nother part of it from your perspective of, of actually taking the journey is very different than my experience as an observer, um, witnessing it and photographing it, which is important, but um, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm a white photographer. Um, and as I said, my, my immigrant story is a long time ago, and we don't even know our immigrant story. And maybe that's, maybe that's one of the sad parts of America, that um, we don't know the immigrant story. And so we pretend that, um, you know, particularly government officials who make all these policies, they don't see themselves as once being immigrants. That whole immigrant life gets hidden or pushed aside. You become an American, and, you know, everyone's for themselves. Um, and that, I think that's a problem. Right. Well, I mean, I, I thank you for your kind words on, on, on my book and my experience. But again, you know, I, I, mean, I think that if you were to speak to any of the people that you photograph 20 years later, they will have a, a very similar story to mine. Uh, except that they're not given, you know, they're, they're not here. They're not on Zoom. They're not, you know, they're not. Right invited to speak about their experiences because, uh, well, there is not, you know. I, true, I have made some decisions that have, have impacted who I am, the way that I express myself. And, you know, uh, I, there was a moment when I decided this is what I wanted to do. So uh, this is, you know, this is where, where I, I think every one of those voices would be good for this conversation, except that, you know, we need to listen to them. Yeah, no, and, and um, I've been, as you know, I've been working on a, a film based on the photographs I made in the 80s. And one of my dreams and my colleague, Andra Sedell, who I'm working with on this film has been to find some of the people in the photographs to, to hear their, you know, what has happened to them? What, you know, are they here? Are they, uh, do they like yourself, you know, um, able to really advance to get a, get educated and get a PhD and have families? Uh, did they go back to Mexico? Um, what, what is that experience like? And that, and that's been, um, you know, obviously challenging to see if we can find people who are in the pictures. Uh, but that, that would be the dream is to give those people a voice uh, beyond just the photograph that I made um, and have this dialogue like we're having. And I think this is, this is a very important dialogue that we need to have in America where we hear voices of, of immigrants um, and people who are undocumented or are still undocumented and the struggle and what their lives are about and, 
and um, being more understanding because I don't think we're, we're not a very tolerant culture. No, I think there are people who are very tolerant and there are other people who are not at all. Like that's, <laughs> that's the same everywhere, right? So, uh, but I think that project that you're talking about would be awesome. I mean, that, that would be really yeah. exciting to see if you could locate at least a few of those people to have this conversation with them. And I, I look forward to, to, you know, to, to participating in any way that I can. Yeah, and we need to. We also need to think. Someone wanted to know about um, the dehumanization of immigrants from Latin America and from other parts of the third world at this time. You know, allegations of forced sterilization, loss of separated parents from children, denial denial of medicines. Boy, it's it's just gotten. It seems to have gotten more and more extreme. It definitely has. I mean, I, I'm, I'm no expert on any of these topics. I mean, the, you know, I came here to talk about my own personal experience, yeah. but uh, the, the degree of uh, cruelty that we are witnessing right now, and the, the I mean, just the, 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 the official response to the humanitarian crisis that we are witnessing at this very moment, is just so awful. It, it is so awful and, uh, you know, I, one of the questions that I've been thinking about lately is this very term, the dehumanization of, of people. I mean, who is really dehumanizing who? I, I, I think that the people who are being, who are dehumanizing themselves, you know, who are the people implementing this kind of uh, measures, right? Now the other people, the other people are being subject to terrible treatment, terrible, you know, uh, to the separation of families you know, putting children in cages, you know, you're not taking away the, the, the humanity of those children, but in a way you're traumatizing those children, right? You're traumatizing them. You, on the other hand, you people who are putting them in cages, you know, you're, you know, kissing your goodbye, your humanity. I mean, basically you're, you're giving it away. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of like the language that we have to like work and change. And I think the narrative around that let me ask you, um, what are you going to tell your child about your experience? Right. So, because <laughs> I know, that, that is a really... you know, as I said, one of the experiences I don't have is that immigrant story has disappeared from my life. And my daughter, who's generations away, doesn't even have, you know, know anything about it. So what do you... What is what? If, what part of you are you going to pass on in terms of your own story? Well, I think I will pass on everything because if I don't, eventually she'll pick up the book and read it herself. So that's <laughs> it, it. Doesn't make any sense for me to uh, to keep anything from her. It's just that I mean, she. I have two daughters, but the, the one is very aware of what's going on. You know, we've gone through the, when the the. Um, the crisis at the border started like you know three or four years ago we we went out there you know to to rally some and whatnot and she's aware you know of the the economic disparities in other places right. and why people cannot just move to a different place if they choose to do so you know by legal means so i i think you know i'm not gonna keep anything from her necessarily you know uh the I think she'll find out eventually. So uh, I think there'll be a, a moment when I when I will share this with her. Yeah, great. Well, it's really great talking with you, Jose. We haven't had a chance to have a long conversation, although I think we've touched each other's lives. I know you've touched my life deeply with your with your powerful writing, and I hope that those who are listening will uh, pick up a copy of my book, Midnight La Frontera, by TBW, and Jose's book, uh, Illegal. University of Chicago Press, um, two important, I, I hope important uh, books about the experience of, of immigrants coming to America. And I do hope that Jose, next time uh, I can invite you to Berkeley and give you a big hug and uh, do it with, you know, students and faculty in person and continue this important dialogue. Um, and it's really been great getting to know you. Definitely. Well, 
Thank you so much for the, the invitation to collaborate in this important project. And I look forward to, you know, to traveling to Berkeley and, you know, speaking to, to, to the audience there and to your students. Thank you so much, Ken. I, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you to uh, uh, Tim um, and the Townsend Center for hosting us uh, today. And um, I hope those of you who are watching will attend um, some of the wonderful Townsend Center events and also check out uh, the events that we have at UC Berkeley at the Graduate School of Journalism. So thank you very much for joining us.